Buenos días a todos en México. Good morning in New York and DC. Este programa será en inglés, por lo que cambio a ese idioma. Welcome everybody. The topic today could not be more timely. Two days after the first presidential debate in the US. We are honored to have with us John Lieber and Carlos Petersen, both of Eurasia. It's a privilege to have to be able to work with you today and to we look forward to more cooperation in the future. Our moderator, Karin Sissis, will introduce our guests properly. Let me just introduce Karin, the editor in chief of the America Society Council of the Americas online website. She has long experience in various publications as a host of podcasts, including Latin American in Focus and the America Society. She has covered issues ranging from immigration to North Korean nuclear tensions. She holds an MA in journalism and Latin American studies from New York University and the BA in history from George Washington University. And we're proud of her being a member of the Mexican Council on Foreign Relations, COMEXI. Again, welcome to this webinar on the US election. Karin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luis, and thank you to COMEXI for having me today. Uh, welcome to everyone who's joining us. Uh, I, I just want to say one thing that I'm very excited to get to talk about this today. As many of you know, I am binational Mexican and, and from the United States, so I get to hear about what's happening in the United States and how it's going to affect my other country. Um, so without further ado, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get through this intro so we can get to these interesting questions. So first of all, Eurasia Group is a leading firm for political risk analysis globally. Um, and uh, we are joined today by John Lieber. He leads the United States practice at Eurasia Group. Um, and he has extensive experience in the US government, including as an economist in the House Ways and Means Committee. He's a director at, uh, as a director at the National Economic Council at the White House and a senior economic policy advisor to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. So we're gonna have a lot of questions for you, John. Um, and then we are also joined by Carlos Peterson. He's a senior analyst in the Latin America practice at Eurasia Group. Uh, he focuses on Mexico and works very closely with companies around the world with interest in the country. And prior to Eurasia Group, he worked at Medley Global Advisors, Integralia, Consultores, and uh, Mexico's Energy Ministry. Um, so I'm going to get right into questions. I have, uh, I have many of them, and we only have about half an hour for our discussion before we turn the floor over and start accepting uh, questions from everyone who's joining us. We already have more than 50 people. I'm sure more will, will start. But Let's get into just this week alone. Um, it's a good thing this is two days after the debate because we got to serve, we got to recover a little bit from Tuesday night's debate. Um, it's fair to say it wasn't quite like any debate we've seen before. But one thing we hear over and over is that debates don't actually change voters' mind. They don't necessarily have an impact on the electoral race. John, what do you think? And is there, can you name one way that you do think this debate will have an impact on the race. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the question. Thanks for having me here today. Um, uh, you know, the debates, the conventional wisdom about debates is that the structural factors in the election just matter so much more than the any in specific news event. And I think given deep polarization in the US where you know, you've got 80 or 80 plus percent of the populace has already made up their mind based on purely partisan considerations, before a debate begins means that you could run a bag of flour on one party and a sack of potatoes in the other party. And those 80% would basically kind of already know where they're voting. So you've got a very small number of um, convincible voters. You also, unlike you know, 50 years ago when um, there wasn't just saturated media coverage all the time, Americans are very, very exposed to both of these candidates. So there isn't a lot left to learn about these debates, which is why for the most part, uh, most analysts who look at this have concluded that the debates, the conventions, the vice presidential pick, all of these things may result in brief fluctuations from the overall trend of the election, but they aren't really game changers um, from the overall narrative. I think one way, um, so you know, one way this particular debate might have changed someone's minds is the president's got a unique style, shall we say, and that's been on display for five years now. Um, but he was, a, I mean, even for his supporters that I've spoken with after this debate, he was a little over the top, even for them. So I think that he really came out swinging and his goal was to force a misstep by Biden. He wants to, you know, 
he wants to make the case that Biden is too old to be president. He's 77. Um, there's some evidence from the primary that he has a hard time kind of, you know, he had a hard time kind of sustaining uh, his energy levels during the entire Democratic debates. And I think the president was trying to trip him up. He failed in this debate, but you're probably going to see that same tactic on display in the second and third debate uh, later in October. Great. And I've seen uh, from from reading some of your materials, John, that you're predicting you're giving John uh, you're giving Biden a two and three chance of winning this. So my question for you, Carlos, is, um, you know, we see a lot of comparisons between Trump and AMLO. Uh, I don't, you know, some of them I'd say I don't know if that really quite makes sense. There's distinct things going on in different countries, but we often see this comparison of them both being populists. Um, and I'm wondering, what do you think? It would mean if Biden did win, what would it mean for AMLO? Would it have an impact on the way that he leads the country? Again, thank you for, for the invitation first, and, and, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I think that actually it would not make that much of a, it don't be, it would not be that big of a change, to be completely honest. And, 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 and the reason why we think that it's because if you look at the way that Lopez Obrador prioritizes his agenda, the issues and the way that he engages with things is very specific and very, very constrained to what he really wants to achieve. And regarding the U.S. relationship, it's not that there is some kind of affinity between Lopez Obrador and Trump that has led to these agreements, to this kind of like a, 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 a appeasement or, or, or good like relationship between the two countries. But I think it's more about Lopez Obrador having a much more focus on his domestic agenda and really don't want it to engage with the U.S. and actually any other issues abroad. He was, wants to keep that relationship as stable as possible. And therefore, that's why whenever Trump's asked for something, Lopez Obrador responds very, really quickly to try to give away whatever the President Trump or the U.S. wants. I think that the same kind of dynamic would function and work under Biden, right? With Biden coming into office, they would have some requests, some demands, and Lopez Obrador wants to focus on his domestic agenda. Therefore, he will continue to work closely with the US to trying to make the relationship as stable as possible, but not really in a sense of like integrating more the two countries or expanding any US-Mexico relationship. That, that's not, not among Lopez Obrador priorities. And as, as we know, the only thing that matters for this administration are Lopez Obrador priorities. So, so, so I think that's, that's why it's a little bit, I think it's difficult to, to believe that there will be that much of a, of, of, of a change in, 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 in the administration and the way that Lopez Obrador behaves if uh, Biden were, were, were to win, right? And the other thing that I would say, and to your point of how similar Trump to Lopez Obrador are, right? I think that was kind of a, a, a subject of four years ago, uh, three or four, you know, when all these anti-establishment leaders were emerging. We heard similarities with, with Lopez Obrador and Bolsonaro as well, or with Trump or with uh, uh, any other like Duterte or, or other of these kind of strong leaders, right? I think that sometimes we very easily put all of them in the same bucket when they're actually very different, not only because of the local dynamics and the realities of the different countries, because of the, but also because of the personalities and, and the, 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 the styles and the way that these people actually work and act and, 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 and govern, right? Uh, and this is a question that's a little bit for both of you. Uh, the, uh, something else that is a little bit, that feels a little bit of a, like a story from four years ago is that in 2016, Mexico was, for, for lack of a better word, Trump's piñata. And he was always beating on, on Mexico. Now, he still does it a little bit. Last night he was saying, oh, Mexico's in a rally. He was saying Mexico is going to pay for the wall. But it almost feels like so old hat at this point that we're just like, ah, oh, whatever. We're going to pay for the wall, whatever. Nobody takes offense at it anymore. Uh, I'm curious what you think, John, in terms of um, how important Mexico would, would be in a second term for Trump, um, as well as... Um, uh, as well as what would happen uh, in terms of U.S.-Mexico relationships, it, the U.S.-Mexico relationship if Biden wins, given that uh, Lopez Obrador recently went to Washington and he didn't even meet with Biden. Uh, give us both scenarios. And Carlos, I have a follow-up question related to that for you. So the big difference between now and four years ago, uh, there's been two major policy changes that have happened. The first is Trump renegotiated NAFTA. So he now owns and is rebranded, owns the rebranded USMCA. It's his deal. Unlike every, you know, his campaign pitch in 2016 was that all these other bozos 
negotiated these bad deals for the last 30 years, but I'm going to fix that. And this is his signature accomplishment. So now he owns USMCA. He can't really complain about Mexico, uh, you know, jobs being outsourced and our lunch being eaten by these uh, cheating low cost countries, which is his whole thing on the 2016 campaign. And the second big change is that immigration's dropped off, illegal immigration's dropped off because of one, the weak economy, no one wants to come here. And two, um, uh, AMLO's responded strongly to the threat of 25% tariffs and moved border enforcement down to the southern border from the northern border of Mexico to the southern border of Mexico. And so because of that, Trump doesn't have much to complain about. Um, and in Mexico has just fallen off the radar as a political issue. Now, replacing that, that's, that's not the dynamic with China. And with China, Trump's taken very strong action there. He's failed to solve the problem. The trade deficit that he ran against um, has grown. He's just not talking about it anymore. But instead, he's pivoted to focus on uh, the, uh, for lack, for using his term, Kung flu, the um, Chinese origin coronavirus. And so that's his big complaint against China. And you know, until Mexico does something like unleashes a global pandemic on the world, um, I think that they kind of stay, I think they'll stay off the radar um, for the rest of the campaign and probably well into a Trump second term. In a Biden administration, you know, USMCA is now the main, the, the most important um, governing, you know, the, the thing that's going to govern the contract in the US and, and Mexico. And I think with Biden, the, the, the innovation in USMCA is the enforceable labor uh, rules and also the enforceable environmental rules. And that's going to be much more of a focus in a Biden administration, um, you know, making sure that those are being followed by Mexican factories, that the Mexican government has proper levels of enforcement and using all the tools in the USMCA to actually force that to happen. Um, you know, there's going to be other issues that I think Carlos will be able to talk more knowledgeably about than I can. But I, I think that's going to be the main, um, the main thrust. It would be really interesting for me to see what happens with immigration as the economy rebounds and under a Biden presidency and the threat of 25% tariffs go away. Do, does the Mexican administration, do they lighten up a little bit? And then what happens with, with legal immigration at that point? Because that could become a political liability for Biden, you know, two, three years down the road. Yeah, I, I do want to move to, to a question for Carlos, but that's a really interesting point because what we're seeing here in Mexico is uh, a lot of signs that we're looking at some real economic issues into the coming year. And one has to wonder um, if it could lead to an increase in, in emigration from Mexico into the United States. And what would that mean for a uh, Biden uh, government, which, you know, during the Obama years, Obama deported more, more people than, than Trump did, right? Um, so what would it mean for Biden? What would it mean for Trump? Um, I'd like to hear from both of you on, on that as well. If, if I could say, John, with you for a minute, and then I'm, Carlos, I do have a question for you related to something John just said. Um, uh, um, so Biden can't go back to Obama levels of deportation. Obama did that in order to um, kind of, uh, you know, soften the ground for uh, an immigration deal. And there's been a lot of blowback on those deportations from the political left who are ascendant in the Democratic Party. So I don't see Biden returning to anywhere close to Obama levels of deportation. Um, he doesn't have the political legitimacy to do so, but also he can get next year or the year after a comprehensive immigration bill without having to do that. I mean, I think that the Democrats are going to be, uh, you know, our base case right now is that Biden wins the White House, but the Democrats also win the Senate. And if they win enough seats in the Senate, they'll be able to pass bills without any Republican input whatsoever, which will make it a little bit easier for them to do the kind of comprehensive immigration reform they've wanted to do for a very long time. It's a little challenging though, because if there's no bipartisan, immigration is an unbelievably toxic political issue. And you know the parties have, the two parties have really diverged in many, many ways. And this is one of the biggest ones uh, the Democrats are kind of the urban coalition, the Republicans are the rural coalition, and views on immigration really couldn't differ more between those two groups. There are some Democrats in the Senate in particular who are going to be very sensitive to the political um, toxicity of immigration. And so as a result, it may be harder for Biden to get a deal on immigration reform. So I suspect that probably just doesn't move it. You get kind of the status quo, lax enforcement, um, and, you know, immigration rebounds with uh, legal immigration rebounds with the economy. 
Interesting. Carlos, uh, I'm wondering what you think, if you see that that could be a potential scenario in Mexico, an increase in immigration. But I also want to get back to something that John touched on. He, he talked about um, uh, China and how China, to some degree, has replaced Mexico as, as uh, the target for, for Trump. Um, I'm wondering, do you see this as an opportunity for Mexico? Has Mexico been taking advantage? Are, are you seeing any signs that Mexico is taking advantage of this opportunity um, given the new USMCA, given its proximity to the United States? Uh, no, yeah, that's super interesting. And it's, it's, it's been very like, interesting to watch what happened before the coronavirus crisis emerged. And obviously we'll have to wait and see what happens after because uh, related to FDI investments and, and, and decisions by, by, by businesses, obviously the, the pandemic is, is, is generating a lot of noise and, 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 and changing the, the, the logic how investments are made, right? That's, 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 that's something that has disrupted any, any plans from companies, right? Uh, uh, but what we saw for in previous years from this decoupling between China and, US and the US, the attempts of reshoring uh, manufacturing facilities from China to the US or elsewhere, the big winners actually had been the Southeast, uh, Southeastern, uh, uh, South, Southeast Asian countries, not really Mexico. Mexico over the past couple of years had not seen very meaningful increases in FDI. It's been mostly companies in Mexico that are like foreign companies already operating in Mexico, investing more here rather than new companies coming into the country. And something that also we have seen is the uncertainty that the, the, uh, domestic politics is generating uh, uh, regarding the potential investments in the future. I think that the biggest changes and the, 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 the biggest, I, I think that discouragements for investments have been the changes to the energy sectors, but particularly to the electricity sector, because the manufacturing sector, as you know, obviously is rely significantly on how can they uh, uh, tap into the grid and use uh, electric electric power and other like schemes that they can use to actually function uh, with certainty into a, like a 20, 30 year landscape, right? These not do they're looking at that one, two, three year uh, investments is a very long term investments, right? So so that that, that I think it's, it's the main problem uh, of the past couple of years. Moving forward, as I was saying, Mexico has a great opportunity to be able to actually attract investment, right? That now USMCA and the uncertainty around that uh, is, is, is behind us. So, so, so that should be uh, not a constraint. Also, the, 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 the US companies and, and international firms are moving out of China probably at a faster, at a faster pace with the, the, the crisis of the coronavirus. And the problem again is I think is Mexico is not doing the job of trying to attract those companies. He's not giving the certainty, uh, a business conf confidence among Mexican companies is not great. And therefore, uh, if they want to bring any partners from outside is not there. So I think that's that's going to be the biggest challenge. And, and, and is Mexico is actually just putting like a stick on their foot by themselves and, and not allowing uh, 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 that to happen uh, faster, right? Again, obviously we are in a very uncertain and, and, and disrupted year, obviously, this year we will, would not see very meaningful FDI anywhere because of, of, of the coronavirus. But moving ahead, I think that the biggest challenges are the own uncertainty that the Mexican government is generating. Very interesting. Um, John, I want to go back to something you mentioned. So you're forecasting that the, the Democrats will take the Senate. Biden has a pretty good chance of winning. So are we looking at a situation where the Democrats, you're, then you're suggesting the Democrats have everything, right? Um, what happens if, uh, if Trump uh, does not lose? What are, what are we looking at in terms of a shift in policy if we've got a Trump White House, but the Democrats are in power? Is everything just going to be complete gridlock? What are we going to see in terms of, of, of uh, a strat a policy going forward? So, you know, the most important factor in that scenario is what happens in the Senate. Um, so, you know, the House, you know, bicameral legislature, the House isn't in threat of flipping Democrats not only are likely to increase their leads this year, um, the, the structural there's you know structural dynamics suggest they'll be the majority in 2022 and 2020 through, through the end of the next term of the president. So the House looks pretty solid for Democratic for about four years. Um, if Trump wins, the Senate probably stays Republican, which means the exact alignment we have today. So I mean I think that you're looking at either kind of a status quo election or um, our base case, I think more likely you're looking at the blue wave where D Biden takes the White House and the Democrats take the Senate. 
So if Trump, in the status quo scenario you're asking about, you just see continued gridlock. Um, you know, I think the, the theme over the last 12 months has been legislation either doesn't pass or it passes by uni passes unanimously. So that means that they pick the lowest hanging fruit to do, which are things like keeping the government funded, you know, the very, very strong fiscal stimulus response earlier this year that's kind of been basically the, the, the air has been taken out of it um, at this point. Um, and, you, you know, you, Trump doesn't have an agenda. He's not running on like a really strong second term agenda that he's going to, unlike in 2016, where he says he's going to come in, undo this stuff, accomplish these things. Now he's basically saying, look, we've done all these great things. America's great again. We're just going to keep it great. But he doesn't have policy specifics beyond that. I think one area he may try legislating is on uh, extending his signature tax cuts from 2017. But the Democrats aren't really interested in that. Um, so what you just see instead is basically gridlock and then fights over the annual appropriations, the annual deadlines for things like appropriations bills. Um, there is a infrastructure highway funding bill that has to pass uh, one year from today, uh, actually one year from yesterday. Um, and so that could be an opportunity for like a big infrastructure bill um, with a lot of new spending on roads and highways. But other than that, I just think you, you see a, you know, the, the, the standard kind of inaction you've come to expect out of the federal government right now. And I imagine that some of this depends on on what comes out of uh, the votes, who's controlling the Senate. But I'm, I'm curious, uh, John, which sectors would benefit from a Biden win and which sectors would benefit from a Trump victory? So Trump's been like the most deregulatory president ever. I mean, I think that he's just been his 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 the number one impetus from the federal government has been reducing regulatory barriers. So that's helped the ag sector um, enormously. It's helped oil and gas tremendously. Um, you know, any area where there's greenhouse gas regulation has been very, very good for Trump. I also think Trump's been good for US-based multinationals. I know that's not exactly a sector, but the tax treatment, their, their tax treatments improved significantly during the Trump administration. And under a Biden administration, you get a flip. So U.S. multinationals, the U.S. would be a less attractive place for U.S. multinationals to be headquartered, both because of a higher tax rate, but also changes to how their overseas earnings would be taxed. You'd see new regulations in the climate space that really hurts uh, farmers, um, oil producers, uh, refiners, you know, pipelines, just anybody that has anything to do with the oil sector. It's all going to turn very negative, worse than I think under Obama, coal, worse than under Obama. Green energy, um, you know, solar power, wind, all that stuff is all going to be very good, much better. Significant, I think you'll see significant federal subsidies for that. I think the transportation sector probably does better under Biden because Biden wants to force this transition to um, net zero emissions. And that means that he's going to have to subsidize auto companies. He's going to have to set up, subsidize uh, technology transition in the auto sector, even though you're going to see higher cafe standards, which would make the cost of producing an automobile go up, um, this, he'll, he'll be pushing more money to that sector for, for innovative technologies. Um, and uh, yeah, those are, those are the ones I'd, I'd highlight as the biggest divergence. And uh, I guess pharmaceuticals and healthcare sector is the other big one. Uh, under like a, if Biden, depending on the size of the majority in the Biden administration, you're either gonna see a massive increase in subsidies for the purchase of private healthcare insurance or if the Democrats get enough seats in the Senate, you're going to see the introduction of a new competitor, a public sector competitor for private for to private health care insurance, which will actually hurt the sector. So I think that's a bit there's a kind of a bit of tension there, depending on what happens in the Senate. And then pharmaceutical industry, I think, gets hurt uh, probably under either presidents, but more so under Biden because he'll do more transformative transformative things to health care. Thank you. Uh, I want to pick up on one thing that John said, Carlos, which he, he t mentioned uh, green energy. Um, and I'm curious, we've, we've seen AMLO has not exactly been the greenest president. Um, what would it mean if Biden comes in and, and starts having a, 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 an agenda that's much more focused on green energy? Will that, how will that affect Mexico? Yes, I, I think that certainly the U.S., it's potentially one of the biggest constraints that Lopez Obrador actually could face on energy policy in general. Uh, 
the recent statements and debates and, and comments about the potential reversal of the energy reform in general terms or, or, or the ongoing changes to the regulatory framework for renewables and, and all of that, uh, I think it's something that the US will increasingly uh, be more actively pressuring the Mexican administration to try to avoid changing that much, right? And, and, and therefore, like for, for instance, a, a reversal of the energy reform, uh, I, I think that potentially uh, the, 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 the US administration could actually uh, act as a, as a constraint and then really kind of like lobby against Lopez Obrador doing so, right? Uh, uh, regardless, regardless of what happens, obviously, like if, if it's Lopez Obrador able to push that through the Senate in Mexico because he doesn't have the 66% majority, et cetera, that's a different discussion. Um, but, but, but to your question specifically on, on, the, on the renewable side and on clean energy and all of that, I think that as, as, labor, as, as, as John said before, the two issues that probably under a Biden administration that are going to become more contentious with Mexico are labor and environmental because the new, the new USMCA uh, increased the standards and, and, and the requirements for Mexican companies and the Mexican government to actually to abide to some standards on labor and on uh, 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 sustainability and renewable energy, right? So, so I think that increasingly that is a potential source of pressure from the U.S. for Mexico to kind of uh, avoid having a, 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 a like a, a kind of move away from from the investments that the country was making in the past towards that sector. Great. I know we're already starting to get questions in, but I want to sneak in a couple more. I'm sorry. I'm going to I'm going to mm -hmm. take advantage as the moderator. Okay, John. I have to ask. Um, the taxes, Trump's taxes, do they matter? Do they have any impact on this <laughs> on the outcome? Um, no, I mean, I, I think that once again, you know, first of all, it's the least surprising bit of news imaginable that the president's been hiding his tax returns because he's got, there's stuff he doesn't want people to know about him. So I, I think that, you know, is it worse than probably I expected? Maybe a little bit. Am I really surprised that the guy's been engaging in what seems to be legal tax avoidance um, because he's a heavy real estate investor for decades? No. Um, you know, I just don't, you know, you look at the conservative, the defense being made of him amongst conservative circles, and it's like, well, of course he's avoiding taxes. That's what every smart businessman does. And so if that's the response from his base, then there's no changing minds here. Either you like the guy and you think that he's like a business killer and he's going to do everything he can to not be a sucker, or you hate the guy and you think that he's cheating the federal government. And there's not a lot of overlap between those two groups. And probably you've already made up your mind before this information came out. So I'd be, I don't see this as being important. If I if I may if I may say something there, uh, when you ask about the similarities between Trump and Lopez Obrador, if you remember during the 2018 campaigns in Mexico, Lopez Obrador was attacked by the opposition several times because they were asking not necessarily about his taxes, but about how what what his like like sources of revenue and how did he live for like I don't know how many years as a leader of the opposition without having a job, right? And I think that that. The base and the people that support these kind of leaders do not care about those issues. That that's not something that they're going to be changing their votes about. And and and, and if they like Lopez Obrador argued, this is the people that is helping me, and I'm the leader of a movement, right? In the case of Trump, is I'm a successful businessman, and I can play around with the with the margins of the law, and and that makes me more makes me smarter and more successful, right? So so I think that's that's one similarity that we could like uh, 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 like point out uh, between the two. I mean, it is instructive about Trump, right? It's like. The guy has suffered so many body blows that would be absolutely fatal to any other politician. And he just keeps going. Like he can just, he's got a base that likes him because of who he is. And he plays by a different set of rules and that works in his favor. You know, the other thing about him is that his ability to just bluster and fabricate his way through any scandal, it just makes him, like, I think every, every I, I hope this doesn't happen, but other politicians can learn lessons from this guy because his personality is so big and his brand is so big that he can just keep on plowing ahead no matter what kind of missiles the, the, the left launches at him. Mm -hmm. And having discredited, having spent four years discrediting the mainstream media helps as well. When you've got, you know, it's like, well, where's the source of this? Oh, it's the New York Times. So I think people can be dismissive of that because it's from the you know, liberal Manhattan-based New York Times. That, that's, another, uh, that's another one that he shares a little bit with the president here in Mexico, right? Carlos, it sounds like, a, it's like hearing a familiar story with certain targets as well. So <clears throat> um, one thing I'm, I, I wanna, I'm wondering is, yes, he gets away with anything. What you're saying, John, reminds me of, what was it that he said that he could stand in the middle of Times Square and, and shoot he someone? Shoots, but he shoots someone on Fifth Avenue and he would lose a single vote. 
<clears throat> that's what it was, right? Is there, we're about to face the, the potential for a really contentious period um, come November after the election. Is there anything that you can see um, given your experience, especially having worked in, in Congress, is there anything that's gonna break the relationship between the Republicans in the Senate and Trump? And Carlos, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in two questions at the same time so you guys can talk. Is there anything if Trump wins that would break the bromance between AMLO and Trump? John, if you wanna start. Um, so um, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a baseball fan. And I'm from California, so I follow the Oakland A's. And Oakland A's compete in baseball with low sal lower salary, and they don't have the money to spend on players. And um, so one of the one of the things that Billy Bean, their general manager, was asked about was clubhouse chemistry. And like you know, he does this thing where he's always rotating players out. And one of the criticisms has been, well, you're always getting rid of these players. How do you have any chemistry in the clubhouse? And Bean's response was, you know, what gets you chemistry in the clubhouse is winning. So that's all that matters. Like if you want your players to get along and be having a good time together, you better keep winning. And his job is to put a winning team on the field. And I think that's the case with Trump and the Republicans in the Senate. Um, as long as they keep winning, they're going to stick by the guy. As soon as this looks like he's a loser, then I think they all start going their own ways. And you're seeing a little bit of that right now with the fiscal stimulus, because as Trump's pop, you know, as the Trump's not, you know, he could still win this election. It's competitive. But as it becomes less likely that he's going to win the election, you see members start to go their own way on fiscal stimulus and start to forge their own policy path. Trump doesn't care about the deficit. That's a growing concern with Senate Republicans. Trump wins re-election. Guess who's not going to care about the deficit anymore? Senate Republicans. So I think that the winning, you know, winning kind of fixes the wounds at least, and at least will buy him a couple of years of goodwill. You know, you saw this with George H. George W. Bush in the last two years of his presidency, where his popularity tanked down to 25% or so, and the Senate Republicans started different, like really distancing themselves from him. Trump's the most popular person in the Republican Party right now. His approval rating with Republicans is about 80%. And as long as he remains popular, they remain loyal to him. But if he loses, um, you know, I don't expect his popularity is going to bottom out, but you will see them try to forge your own path. Mm -hmm. And Carlos, I, I pass my bromance question over to you. Yes, I think I think there is potentially another like stronger bromance between Lopez Obrador and another American, which is John, because he's a, also a baseball fan. So so that we, we should explore that in the future. But um, I, I I'm not sure that there is that big of a bromance. I th I think I think that it's 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 this appeasement strategy by Lopez Obrador. I think I think that as I was saying before, Lopez Obrador, the way that he has been operating and functioning throughout his administration is the following way. He has a, an extremely centralized governing style that every single decision among, about the most important issues that he cares about are being decided within the presidential office by him. And then he delegates that responsibility to implement those ideas to his cabinet. They are not there to shape his views. They are there to implement those views. And anything that falls outside of that purview, then is more, there is more flexibility about what the different cabinet members and people from government can do. And, and, and foreign policy, I think is precisely that. Lopez Obrador, the only thing that he really cares, I think, it mostly cares, it's to have a stable neighbor that they don't get involved in domestic policy and, and they don't get too intrusive and, and, and like bother whatever he wants to achieve locally. Uh, and also something that he constantly mentions and that he cares a lot about are remittances, right? And I think that's potentially one area where he could be more sensitive about what the U.S. does uh, if Trump continues to, like he has suggested recently again, that he might uh, put taxes on remittances and something like that. Uh, we think that is extremely, like very difficult uh, or could be very difficult politically and legally for him to do so, but that's another story. But, but that's touching those issues that actually would destabilize Mexico more economically or politically, those are the things that would potentially be more uh, controversial or uh, kind of generate more tensions between the two. But again, I think that Lopez Obrador will continue to leave Marcelo Ebrard and other people in the trade arena to lead those efforts because he is not really that much interested on, on, on dealing with Trump. It's okay, he has an issue with the, the immigration, let's fix it, let's just do it. He has an issue with 
a trade and he wants to keep uh, revamp USMCA, okay, that's fine. Uh, so, so, so I think it's, that's, that's more the logic behind it than really some, some like common uh, uh, friendship or, or anything like that. Okay, I'm gonna sneak in one question for, for either of you can answer because you're both in the United States. I think one thing um, that I find harder and harder to explain all the time the longer I live here is, is uh, US elections. And the more I explain the electoral college, the crazier it sounds to me living here in Mexico. Um, which states do you think will decide this election, particularly knowing that we're looking at a complex election with, with write-in ballots and everything? Florida and Pennsylvania. So Trump's got to win Florida. If he doesn't win Florida, he's got very, 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 very narrow path to victory. Um, and if Biden wins Pennsylvania and Florida, it's over for Trump. Um, if Trump wins Florida and Pennsylvania, then he's got a path. And so I think on election night, and the good thing here is that on election night, Florida um, counts early. So they're actually, they have a lot of experience in mail ballots. The concern with mail ballots is that they take a long time to count because they come in late. And so that's why it may take, uh, that's why people think this won't be called on election night. But if Florida's called for Biden on election night, I think that you've got, you could have fairly high confidence that Biden's going to win the election overall. Mm -hmm. Carlos, was that I a similar know. answer than you were expecting? No, I, that was exactly the sort of answer. That was good. I, I wanted a nice, simple answer. I've seen Wisconsin thrown out there, so it's interesting to hear. It, Wisconsin could be a bellwether, but there's a path for Trump to win Wisconsin and lose Michigan and Pennsylvania and lose Florida. And so, it, like, so you got it. Florida is the most important. Would you say so? It comes down to about four or five states. Well, there's six states that we're following the most closely: Florida, Arizona, North Carolina, uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And of those, Florida and Pennsylvania are the, are the two keys. Okay, great. And if we had a call, um, if Trump, if it's a, amongst those six, if the, amongst those six states, if one of the two candidates wins a majority of those six states, they're probably going to be president. Doesn't matter what combination, except probably you have to have Florida. Um, and if the if the um, six states are split three three, then it's going to be potentially a contested outcome and take a long time to decide. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Carlos, unless you wanna add something, I'm gonna start opening it up to questions, great? Okay. Uh, uh, Jen, so, Jen is on the topic, so yeah. Okay, great. So um, I have a question first from Luis Rubio. Um, Hillary Clinton had a project to force Mexico to deal with corruption, uh, uh, and that was a prospect that was, uh, that caused fear for Mexican politicians. Do you see any, anything similar coming from Biden were he to win? I haven't seen any specific anti-corruption plan from Biden. I mean, this campaign has not been about foreign policy. It's been about domestic policy. And, um, you know, I think one of the mistakes Hillary Clinton made was just, she had just all these policy plans that didn't matter electorally, whereas Trump was hammering his two or three issues. And I think Biden's kind of learned that lesson and is much, much more focused on rebuilding the domestic economy than doing anything globally even though, you know, because message globally is, you know, is going to return America to its role as kind of a leader. So I haven't seen anything specific on this matter. I also think the facts, I assume, knowing very little about Mexico, sorry, that the facts on the grounds might have changed in the last four years that could affect things, but Carlos might have a better answer on that. No, that's totally true. And, 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 and what we have been hearing from, from the team within the Biden campaign that is focusing on Latin America, actually Mexico is not that big on the, on the priority list, even for that team. It's, it's kind of keeping that stable relationship with Mexico, focusing on the labor and, and environmental standards, all of that. But uh, I, I think that the Biden administration actually might have something more to do with immigration in Central America and, 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 and something more looking more south than really Mexico, to be completely honest. On corruption specifically, I haven't heard anything that they are very concerned about. Great. I'm getting a question that, that I think came in at the same time I was asking the, the, the question about the state. So I'm not going to read this, the entire question um, from Carlos Lopez Portillo, but it, it, the question was about states and then also the, the, the Trump losing scenario and whether he will concede. And I'm going, I'm a, I am gonna bring up the toaster thing from this morning, which I was talking about Carlos about with Carlos before. So, so um, the New York Times has a Spanish language newsletter and they were raising the, the, this kind of idea of, 
when you go to the store and there's a $300 toaster, you're like, no, 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 I'm not going to buy that $300 toaster. Um, uh, I don't need all those bells and whistles. So you go to the $100, you see the $100 and you're like, I don't need a $100 toaster. Yeah, it's got the bagel connector thing, but I don't need that, right? And then you, you end up buying the $75 toaster and you feel like, oh, I got a deal, $75 toaster. Then you get home and you realize I could have just gotten the $30 toaster. I don't, it's just toasting bread, right? So what I'm wondering is, when we look at the scenario of the this election and um, what could happen between say November 3rd and November 10th, like think about that, that $300 toaster is this thing that's so big, that's so like, oh my gosh, this is chaos. Is Trump trying to put the $300 toaster in front of us so we think that is just so ridiculous? Are we gonna be in a $300 toaster situation? Are we gonna be in a situation where things are so chaotic um, or do you think it's, it's, we're going to just end up with a normal toaster and, and a, a pretty easy slide into inauguration in January? What do you think, John? Um, Trump's whole strategy right now, he knows he's behind. Um, and his whole strategy is to delegitimize the ballots that are overwhelmingly likely to favor Biden, which are the mail ballots, because um, voters are telling pollsters that nationally Democrats are much more likely to vote by mail about the ratio is like two and a half to one of, of Democratic vote, mail votes to Republican mail votes. So Trump's whole strategy is to say these mail votes just shouldn't count. You know, we should have an election, a clean election where everyone goes in person and all these mail votes should be thrown out. And even if all the mail votes are thrown out, that would certainly help Trump. Um, it may not be, it still may, be, may not be enough if the election's not close. So, you know, I don't, I think ultimately Trump's strategy fails to change the outcome because Election officials across the country know what they're doing. They know they have to count the mail ballots and there's gonna be state certifications that you know, declare the winner based on all the ballots that were legally cast, which is the mail ballots. Now the question is um, what's legally cast and who decides that? So Trump's strategy is to delegitimize the mail ballots that would then give his legal team enough recourse to choose all these challenges and key places that could swing the vote his way and that could end up being effective. So like, you know, I think that the honest answer here is, I don't know, um, his strategy is clear. There's a path to achieving his strategy. Um, most likely what you'll see is, you know, kind of the networks and the Republican political establishment um, and the secretaries of state across the country all saying, look, yeah, we get it. You don't like that there was a couple ballots accepted without postmarks, but, this is the outcome and we're gonna accept it. So I think that's probably the most likely outcome and maybe that's your, maybe that's your hundred dollar toaster, I'm not really sure. Um, but it's, 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 you know, it's, it's a significantly higher than zero probability you end up in this really complicated, fluid and hard to read situation. Um, our base case is, you know, 75% chance we know the winner, uh, maybe 80% chance we know the winner within 10 days or so of election night and you don't have this confusing situation. Hmm. That, does, that sounds kind of, $100 toaster, 80%. <laughs> um, so I, I uh, want to take a, a, this is an interesting question, Carlos, unless you have something to add, I'm going to go on to the next question. Um, uh, this is from Alberto Tena. John spoke about the generational change coming for the upcoming years in, in U.S. demographics. And uh, so the question is, do you believe this expected transition will provoke a change in style for the Republican Party in the midterm? Yeah, so there's this is a great question, and I think that like you could write a book. I'm sure somebody has written a book on this. Um, the, um, there's no permanent coalitions in politics, so you know what happens is that a, a party shifts and aligns until they find a winning coalition. Trump kind of forced some change in the coalitions that were already happening anyway, um, and the recent the recent realignment in the U.S. has been around the Democrats becoming the urban party and the Republicans becoming the rural party, and the suburban voters are the swing voters. And under Trump, um, you know, you saw a lot of kind of college-educated white suburbanites shift towards the Democrats in the 2018 midterm because they're just turned off, you know, they don't they were turned off by Trump. And one of the questions of this election cycle is that does that process kind of accelerate or does does it kind of return? Like we're, that's one of the things we're watching right now. Biden's got a healthy lead both with college-educated white voters and non-college-educated white voters, um, which is kind of a, a swap from the Clinton uh, Trump dynamic. Um, you know, the, the Republican Party tends to be whiter. 
uh, tends to be older, um, tends to be more rural, and old white people are a shrinking demographic in the U.S. relative to young, um, uh, diver younger, more diverse people. So the Republican base is shrinking. Trump kind of proved there's a way to rig the Electoral College to win a national majority and maintain the Republicans. The Republican Party is a national party. But 10 years from now, that's going to look, look a lot different as demographic change in Texas and Georgia, um, North Carolina, Arizona starts taking those states out of the Republican column and moving them towards the Democratic column. But there's no permanent coalitions. So, you know, the realignment, you saw realignment in the 70s where the parties became more geographically oriented, where, you know, there's really no more Southern Democrats, there's really no more Northeastern Republicans. Um, and then you, you're, we're going through another realignment around this rural urban split. In 10 years, you know, I don't think the parties are gonna look like they do now. Um, and one of the interesting things we're looking at in the, this current election is that Biden has a deficit with Hispanic voters. So Biden is behind where Clinton was uh, in Hispanic support, and they're not necessarily going towards Trump. Trump's about where he was in 2016, which is about where Romney was in 2012. Um, but they're not exactly enthusiastically flocking towards Biden. So you'd expect, you know, maybe that's polling error, and maybe there will be some reversion to the mean and Hispanic, Hispanic voters break for Biden in the last second. The Republican strategists I talked to, they think Trump has a chance of increasing his vote with Hispanics. Um, even though, you know, because depending on, you know, there's more conservative Hispanics, like who tend to be Cubans and Venezuelans living in Florida. There tend to be more liberal Hispanics and tend to be uh, maybe Mexicans and Ecuadorians living in Arizona. Um, and so there's, there's diversity within the Hispanic coalition. And then there's kind of, you know, second generation English primary at home Hispanics who tell pollsters, they generally tend to vote and look more like white Americans than they look like kind of recent immigrants. So there's a lot of interesting things going on under the hood. And I think that's actually a, um, unlike the African American demographic, which has been very solidly uh, democratic for a long time, I think there's more opportunities for Republicans uh, to increase their vote with Hispanics. And over the longer term, I think you're gonna, you'll see those demographic, those changes play out and change the Republican coalition over the next 10 years. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna keep going, Carlos, unless you have something to, to add. Uh, this question might be something that's really for both of you. Um, do you see a Biden administration taking a strong stand in defense of democratic institutions and demanding that Mexico rehabilitates the agendas and capacities of its now weakened government offices to channel bilateral co cooperation? And could Biden uh, condition cooperation and security or implicitly become a con uh, uh, in some way a control or a, to, to, uh, I'm trying to get the wording right here, or implicitly become a control watcher of the 2021 electoral process in Mexico. So, so, um, it, so in some way put some pressure on uh, Mexico in terms of its its midterm election uh, and making sure that it's transparent and and in term and and has and backed by institutions. Uh, yeah, maybe I can I can take it first and 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 first of all, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but I I would expect first that there is a some kind of normalization of the State Department and and and, and in general uh, uh, the these institutions that have worked and collaborated between Mexico and the U.S. that have been some kind of, somehow depleted under the Trump administration and weakened in in in, in to, to some regard. So so that could be some tide and increase on on the collaborations and relationship between the two. But also I think that it's important to 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 remember that I think a lot of the problems that Mexico is facing right now on its security strategies and policies, etc., are again because of its own policies and its own domestic uh, uh, issues, right? And, 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 and we have not seen a very coherent strategy on security. We have not seen a very coherent strategy on, on different issues that, that actually used to be more collaborative with the US, but I don't think it's because Lopez Obrador wants to move away from that collaboration with the US. It's just because there is no big plan or, or very like cohesive and, 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 and very uh, you know, uh, broad and good thought strategy about this specific issue. So I don't think that it's that much about US-Mexican relations. It's just about how the inefficiencies and the problems of how the public administration in Mexico is operating uh, uh, right now. I think, I think that's the main problem. Um, and, and, and how much involvement the US administration could have on democratic institutions in Mexico, I think it's limited. I think that 
to be completely honest, yes, we have seen so the erosion of some institutions in Mexico, uh, 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 mostly on, again on the energy sector, not that much on on the democratic uh, uh, political side. Uh, uh, the INE is still there, the tribunals are still there. So, so it's hard for me to believe that the U.S. like feels that there is some kind of level of alarm that it has to intervene or at least be more concerned about what happens in the elections in Mexico. Uh, so I don't think that there should be, they, they, they will act as, as, as a very active watchdog of elections in the future. I don't think that's, that's, that's where we're heading. I also think that if I'm Mexico and some American comes and starts lecturing me about my elections, I'd say, go look at your own backyard. And so I think that's, there's a lot to fix in the US that's been exposed by Donald Trump and so in the Biden administration. That's, that's, you got to deal with that first. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, to go back a little bit to some of the things that you were saying about the, the Latino electorate, uh, I have a question from Veronica Ortiz. Do you expect a higher Latino or, or Hispanic voter turnout uh, than in 2016? I'm not sure. This isn't something I've looked at. I think turnout generally is going to be through the roof this year. Um, mm -hmm. People are expressing high, high, high levels of interest in this election. Um, they're telling pollsters, you know, 80 or 85% of them are, are following this very closely, which for October 1st is really shocking. Mm -hmm. um, so I would expect participation up across the board. Also, states are expanding access. So most states, because of the pandemic, are making it a lot easier to vote this year, either by opening up more early polling locations, creating new mail drop boxes, or uh, easing the rules on mail voting. So I think uh, I would expect across all demographic groups, uh, turnout is up this year. Great, thank you. I have a question from Roberto Dondich. There has been some noise about a possible Republican effort to get state legislators to appoint pro-Trump electors to the Electoral College, uh, regardless of, of what we're seeing as the vote outcome. How viable is that? And how damaging is that in the long term for US democracy? This is the $20 trillion question um, because you know we wrote about this in a special report in July where this is really the nightmare scenario for the election. So Trump's entire strategy, whatever he's doing, doesn't matter as long as there's a clear winner in each state or enough states, I guess I should say, to give Biden 270 votes, undisputed votes in the Electoral College. So that's the game here. And Trump's entire strategy is to delegitimize the mail ballots and try to get some group of elected officials in enough states to say that he won that state. And in that situation, um, Congress is supposed to be the one who adjudicates disputed claims on the Electoral College at the state level. And um, if, con if, the, if the, ho the House is very likely to remain Democratic, if the Senate stays Republican, this strategy could succeed. So it's really concerning. And I, fat tail risk, you know, 5% chance this, this comes to pass, probably less than that. But if it does come to pass, there's no way to resolve the conflict. And I think this is exact, this is the important thing to understand about this, is that Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and North Carolina all have Republican, or excuse me, Democratic governors, but Republican legislatures. And the federal statute that dictates how Congress, the federal government, specifically Congress, counts and adjudicates the Electoral College is a very weak statute that's subject to, like, subject to constitutional challenge and really relies on partisan actors acting in good faith to resolve conflicts. And if that doesn't happen, you're gonna be in a very unprecedented situation, but to get there, you need uh, an alternate certification at the state level um, from a Republican legislature. And I know that's that's like super confusing and it gets really technical and legal really fast, but it's that's like the nightmare scenario. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually coming up close to 10 o'clock. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at questions and I, I'm going to take advantage to ask a question because there's one big issue that we have barely touched on, and that is the coronavirus. I mean, we have barely talked about, which is incredible when you think about it. We know that um, we just hit one million uh, de coronavirus deaths worldwide. Uh, about a fifth of them are in the United States. We're looking at very different approaches towards the coronavirus, whether it's Trump or whether it's Biden. So I'd be really interested in hearing what the two of you are hearing from clients if they're, uh, you know, we're seeing that Biden is taking a more safe approach to uh, what could be a second outbreak if we, if we see that, 
What do you think will happen? What are people saying? Are there economic fears around one approach versus another? Um, and Carlos, I, I want to also have you weigh in on if you think Biden wins and there's a more uh, a safer, more uh, controlled uh, approach to the pandemic, would that in some way influence AMLO in his approach? You know, the U.S. response is just about the vaccine. So there's there's clearly, no, doesn't matter who's president, the federal response is obviously going to be very weak and left up to the governors. And Trump's just, Trump right now is just crossing his fingers, hoping for a vaccine. Biden comes into office in January if he wins. And, you know, Right now, it looks like we'll be on a path towards having a vaccine. So I think that just overwhelms the entire rest of the story. At the local level, it's a little different. You know, you've got some states kind of going back and, you know, schools aren't open, bars aren't open, restaurants aren't open. That's going to get a lot harder in the winter than it is right now. And the weather's pretty good in the Northeast and across the country. Um, but and so maybe you get some more political blowback like in January. But I think that right now the whole plan is just to wait for the vaccine. Hopefully this will be done by next July and we can all move on is, is kind of the attitude I get both from clients and the sense I get from from the government. On the Mexican front, I think that that's that's the strategy as well, right? Uh, we have what we have seen from Marcelo Ebrard over the, the past several weeks or even months is, is, is securing the access for the vaccine to the vaccine for Mexico, right? And and so far, I think they they have done a good job. They are talking to the right stakeholders. They have been working with the U.S. and other entities to try to guarantee that when it happens. Obviously, emerging markets in general have a much more rougher like future in that sense because they are going to be back in the line compared to the countries that have are producing the vaccine, etc. But Mexico, I think, has been doing a decent job on that. I don't know exactly if there is going to be like more stringent restrictions by a like Biden administration and how that could that affect Mexico. But I thinking of scenarios, if, if you start to see a second outbreak in Mexico, cases ramping up again, I wouldn't be entirely surprised if there's some kind of like travel restrictions or something like that between the two countries, which Trump has avoided and, and Lopez Obrador has been happy to, to avoid as well, uh, uh, not compared to other places. But uh, uh, I, I think that could be a possibility, right? Uh, but I don't think that there is going to be much more than that. I think it's, again, for Mexico, the, the vaccine is also the top priority and uh, uh, the response domestically is, is business as usual. Mm -hmm. uh the, the one other big thing that we didn't touch on is the Supreme Court. What will happen um, with the Supreme Court in the United States, John, and what happens if the election ends up in the court's hands, um, given that, that Trump is trying to push through another nominee? This will be the last question. Um, so I, I think Republicans will confirm uh, Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court before the election. They have time, barely enough time. That's the, probably the biggest enemy right now. They have the votes. Um, and I think it probably gets done. If it doesn't get done after the election, I mean, it doesn't get done, then after the election, you're in a different situation, especially if Biden wins. So it's it, it might be harder, but I think, I assume that she gets confirmed. In terms of what happens if the election ends up in the Supreme Court, um, it's, it's up to this, the Supreme Court makes rulings, yes. They can decide certain things about state counts and they can instruct states to stop counting and, and do certain things. It may not matter. In the nightmare scenario where you have the president pushing for an alternate certification like we talked about earlier, um, the courts can't stop that from happening. Um, I mean, they might be able to, but ultimately it's pure politics. And if, there's politic if Trump's moves have political legitimacy, and the support of the institution, like the institutional bigwigs in the Republican Party and the donors and so forth, he can fight even with a Supreme Court decision. And, the, and, the, and, and I'll just leave with that. I'll end with this. In 2000, Bush v. Gore was the Supreme Court case that everyone thinks decided the, the Florida election and pushed the vote to Bush. That's not true. There was a Supreme Court case, but what really decided the election was Gore's decision to concede. He could have kept fighting even after the Supreme Court ruled the recount had to stop in Broward County. But the Republican Secretary of State of Florida had already certified the election for George Bush, and he didn't see himself as having a path towards winning in Congress. If Trump or Biden sees themselves as having a path towards winning in Congress, even after a Supreme Court ruling, 
they can push ahead and get it all the way to the January 6th deadline when the joint session of Congress meets. So this can really drag on. And for more, you can read our July special report on this topic, which gets into some detail and, and talks about the, how you end up in this nightmare scenario. Thank you, John. Um, thank you to both of you for this really fascinating discussion. Um, I'm going to pass this over to Veronica now to, to wrap up. And I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, for moderating this most interesting uh, panel. Thank you, John. Thank you, Carlos, and uh, Comexis team and Felipe over there in Eurasia for making this possible. As uh, Luis Rubio said, it's, it's a privilege and we hope to continue collaborating, uh, especially on this such an important election, not only for you, for us and for the world. So thank you again, hope to be seeing you and uh, hopefully uh, in Mexico sometime in the near future. And in the meantime, have a great day. Thank you to all our participants. And please follow us on Comex's webpage to see what other events we are still having uh, in stock for you. Thank you so much.